Hello, I'm Richard Nicholl, and for those of you who don't know me, I am the chair of the Caterham and Lotus 7 Club. Um, I'd like to welcome all our members this evening to this webinar with Caterham Cars. Uh, and also, as I say, thank the gentlemen from Caterham for giving up their evening to talk to us. Uh, let me now quickly run through the programme for this evening, uh, and then I'll be able to introduce you to the Caterham Cars team. Um, first of all, um, what I will do is introduce you to that team, and they will have um, about 20 minutes to actually um, give you an idea of the strategy and what's actually happening on the company as, uh, as we speak then we're going to try a new feature. Uh, Simon Lambert is going to give us a walk round of the latest Caterham model. That's the 170. Uh, and the plan is to do that for about 20 minutes. Uh, once that's been completed, we'll conduct a question and answer session. Again, about 20 minutes. And that's primarily for effectively uh, the, the answer, the questions that came in, uh, the pre-delivered the, the pre questions that were sent by people. Um, and then if we do have a, a, an opportunity, then we'll hopefully wrap up the evening by some uh, quick fire questions that come in on the on the chat tote, uh, meaning broadly, we should be able to wrap up about 8.30 or, or around the time that, that Caterham have had enough of us uh, and have better things to do. So um, before I hand you over to Graham, I'm going to ask John to do the very first poll. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm John Martin. Uh, I'm going to be running the polls uh, this evening. Um, we have, as Richard said, we've got uh, five polls, but two of them are going to have an A and a B section. Uh, and a couple of them are repeats from last year. So we thought it'd be interesting to see how people's views might have changed on a couple of things. The first poll, how many sevens have you owned? This is actually one we managed to miss out an option for last time, so we thought we'd rerun this poll. There we go. And I'll hand back over to Richard. OK, thank you very much, John. Um, looking at the fact that 3% um, of our members have had more than four, I'm assuming, uh, Graham, they must be in some sort of gold card members club uh, <laughs> that you must run. Uh, and if you don't run one for people like that, then maybe I suggest you do. Um, but uh, on that flippant comment, let me now introduce uh, the main event of tonight, uh, Graham MacDonald, David Ridley and Simon Lambert. Graham, over to you. OK, well, thank you, Richard. Um, and good evening, everyone. And, and thank you for joining us again. Uh, for those that have done it before, um, I sincerely hope that I don't bore you too much by repeating anything that I said last time. Um, I believe it's about 10 months since we had the last webinar. And if that is correct, we were right in the midst of um, due diligence, because as most of you will be aware, I'm sure if not everyone, we were actually acquired by VT Holdings um, on the 31st of March 2021. And I, and I believe that the last webinar was just before that. Um, I was told by Richard earlier to tell you that business is good, um, but uh, I, I will. And I have to be honest and say, yes, business is good. Um, we have had a tricky year, as indeed I think have most businesses, uh, or a tricky two years, you know, coming through pandemic uh, in 2020, and then also into 2021. We started 2021 with a lockdown, if I recall. Um, so I, I, I thought I would share with you the results um, and the results I'm going to share with you now are for the 12 months to December 21, um, which we ha have produced in a management form. They won't be audited because we are actually changing our financial year, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So we actually turned over in the 12 months to December 21, 21.8 million pounds, which if you compare to our, our best year of, of the last few years, we turned over 22 and a half million pounds in 2019. Uh, but in 2020, the first year of the full pandemic, we did a mere 16.8 million. Um, 
we managed uh, and we measure on a, a, an EBITDA uh, level. And, and for those that are not accountants or, or, or maybe don't know or not interested, EBITDA is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization. And we measure ourselves in that because for us, the business has always been about cash. Um, our previous shareholder made it quite clear that he didn't want to inject any money into our business whatsoever. We had to stand on our own two feet. So for us, we had to measure ourselves in cash generated. And the EBITDA is effectively a, a measure of that. Um, so for 2021, despite turning over the best part of £22 million, pounds, we actually made an EBITDA profit of a mere £80,000. So as good as damn it, we broke even. Now, we, we were quite pleased with that, um, quite pleased that we broke even and didn't lose a shed load of money purely because of the issues we've had. Um, we've had lockdown, we've had supply issues, we've had problems with suppliers. Um, we've had the, all of the things that you've heard in the press, we have suffered. Um, apart from probably very until very recently, the chip shortage. We didn't suffer too much from that until about the latter end of 2021. So we, we broke even effectively in 21. That was compared to 2019, where we made £625,000 of EBITDA. 2020, we also broke even. Um, and our budget for last year, 2021, was actually a £600,000 budget. So um, you can see we were taken over by new owners in March. Um, they'd been presented with all our full year forecasting data, which was showing a £600,000 EBITDA profit, uh, and we managed to break even. Um, so there is one good thing, I guess, and that is myself and my current management team are still sat in our job. So I'm guessing my new owners either haven't got around to doing anything yet or think that we're actually doing something right, um, considering there's a, there's a worldwide pandemic on. And um, we built, I don't know if I said this, we built 482 cars in 2021, and that was about 80 units short because we'd budgeted to build 536 cars. So, you know, I say business is good, um, and you might question, how can I possibly say business is good when I've had two years where I've effectively just broken even? I feel as a small business with very little, well, no support from my previous owner um, and a new owner coming on board, um, I feel who, who, who hasn't yet had a lot of involvement in the business, although he's started starting to grow. Um, I feel that, we, you know, to break even in all the issues and the problems we've had, we, we've kind of done OK with that. Um, the good thing is and how we measure ourselves as a business is we measure ourselves by our forward order book. And um, Richard just touched on it there briefly. Despite only building um, 482 cars last year, we actually took orders for 651 cars. Um, and that was against a budget of 540. So whilst I had a, a higher budget of EBITDA to achieve um, and we failed to achieve it, we had a lower budget of new car orders to take and we blew it out of the water. And David Ridley will confirm, I'm no doubt, and... Um, and take all the accolade for this, but he will tell me and tell you that 651 orders, I believe, is the highest number of orders we have taken in a calendar year since uh, the 90s, if I recall. So we've had a, a tremendous year for orders. So I can sit here and say business is good because I have an order bank that is 650 orders, sorry, we grew by 650 orders in 2021, but it currently means I've got a 12 month forward order book, okay? So for me as the CEO sitting here, and indeed for my new owners, um, to buy a business that has a 12 month forward order book is not actually a bad place to be. However, I do realize that a 12 month forward order for someone that walks into the showroom and, and wants to order a car from us, 12 months is a little bit on the long side. So we, obviously have to do something about that. Um, and what we've got to do, the only way we can improve on that and get that order book down is to build more cars. Um, so 
we're planning to do that. And uh, just to take a step back, so VT acquired us back in March um, 2021, as I said. And one of the things they said initially was, uh, you have to get the delivery time down for our cars into Japan. So at that time, we had a, somewhere between a six, near a nine month forward order book. But the cars, when they ship to Japan, take about three months on the water. So they were already seeing a 12 month delay from point of order through to com through delivery of cars. Um, unfortunately, now that I've got a 12 month order book, they're now looking at a 15 month lead time. So they have made it quite clear to me and my management team that, um, you know, we've done a great job taking all these orders, but actually what we've got to do now is the hard part and that's build more cars. Um, and for those that were here last year, we'll know that, you know, that has not been easy for us, mainly around our supply chain, but uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, being owned by VT, I have to say, has been a little bit of a culture shock um, for all of us, if I'm honest. Uh, I've come from a background of, of large multinationals, but I've had the luxury of being with Caterham now nearly 15 years, and for the last 10 years before VT, uh, we were owned by Tony Fernandez. And um, to say that Tony Fernandez was laid back was very much an understatement. Um, I think if um, uh, Tony was not really interested in the business, if I'm brutally honest, uh, and, and let, uh, all the time that we weren't asking them for any funding. So as I said to you, we've measured ourselves on EBITDA because for us, it's been important to ensure that we have the funding in place and are generating the cash flows to keep the business running. So for the last um, nine or 10 years under Tony, we had no real reason to go to him for any help. Uh, I think post the F1, we, we, we had a little bit of help from him. But after that, we pretty much ran the business on a shoestring and managed to keep it going with very little or, or no strategic guidance or no input from Tony Fernandez. Um, to give you an idea, I can probably count on one hand the number of board meetings I had in the 10 years we were owned by Tony Fernandez. We now have a board meeting once a month with uh, VT Holdings, um, which in itself has its own challenges, not only because of the time difference, they are nine hours ahead of us, so we end up starting the board meeting at 8 a.m., which is 5 p.m. in Japan. Um, we also have the issue of translation. So we present in English, and there are one or two of the board members who uh, can speak English, but the majority can't, so it all has to be translated. And the other thing we've found with our new owners is that, uh, understandably so, they want to take a control on what we're spending. So every single part of capital expenditure has to be signed off. So whereas with Tony, it didn't matter what I did, I effectively ran the business along with um, Simon, David and Trevor. We ran the business as we saw fit um, as long as we continued to generate cash. With um, VT, the initial shock came to us, I think when we needed to order a, a new PC for a new member of staff that was in the budget, uh, we'd appointed the member of staff and we went to um, order the laptop and VT wanted a capital expenditure signed off for a £1,500 laptop for that new member of staff. Um, so, so that kind of shows um, the sort of how things have changed for us. It's become a lot more structured, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I have to say for myself, and, and I, I don't know whether I speak for my colleagues, it, it has been a little bit of a shock to the system because we ran the business pretty much as if we owned it. We were in a very lucky and privileged position under Tony Fernandez. Now we are uh, owned by a multinational. We are having to um, toe the line a bit more, which I think, you know, we are, we are um, getting to grips with that. Um, I find every morning now when I sign on on my laptop at eight o'clock in the morning, whatever time I start work, I come to a tranche of emails from Japan because, of course, the time difference. They've been working whilst we've been sleeping. 
and then we spend the day answering the emails and then they answer them overnight. So we are certainly seeing a lot more involvement from our owners. Um, the good thing is, Kazuhu Te Takahashi, sorry, Kazuhu, Kazuho Takahashi, who is our owner, as we know him as Takahashi-san, um, when he bought the business, he made it quite clear, not only did he want cars delivered to Japan more quickly, but he also wanted to protect and develop the seven to help us meet legislative changes ahead in, that lie ahead in the future. So we have a guy now and a company who are keen to be involved and keen to help Caterham develop. Um, as part of the, the new ownership, they've appointed three further directors. Uh, one is a gentleman called Bob Lashley as my chief strategic officer. Um, and he was, for any of the petrol heads around, he was the former Nissan Global Sports Car Programme Director and is quite well known for his involvement in the, um, the GTR, I think it was, and various sports car programmes for Nissan. Uh, they've also appointed Justin Gardner and as my chief operating officer. And um, Justin was formerly the brand manager for Caterham in Japan. Now, to be fair to Justin, um, he's based in Japan but um, he has, a, he has a, an arm's length um, relationship with us because he realises he can't run the business from, a chief, from an operating side based out in Japan. So he's got a, a, a name by title. And I think that was probably to do with the fact that he was uh, fundamental in and, and instrumental in securing the deal with VT Holdings when they purchased it off Tony Fernandez. And they've also um, appointed one further director, um, Takuya Yamazaki, uh, or as we know him as Taksan, um, as my business transformation officer. And he was formerly the general manager of business and corporate strategy within Toyota. So we they have placed a couple of high hitting names on our board and we are already seeing um, results from these guys um, being with us. So Bob is helping us on the, um, particularly on the supply chain side, which we'll touch on later. And uh, TAC is helping us look at the strategy of models for the future as well. Uh, and just one final point is to show the commitment, um, VT have secured a further one million pounds of borrowing facility for us on top of our current borrowing facilities. So um, yeah, Richard, Apologies for that. That's me finished blabbing on. Uh, over to you again. No, in fact, I, I probably cut in a little too quickly. So um, the, the one thing I will do, though, is uh, a couple of people have asked, Graham, you talked about the 482 orders. Yes. Are, are, they, are they slots? So are, does that include kits or are kits on top of that 482? No. So 482 was actual full, uh, was, was, was total production. So that includes kits and fully built. That's how many we built. And, and there was a slight nervousness a couple of people mentioned, obviously prioritising Japan, but will that have implications for those keen members who are hoping to buy cars in the UK? No, not at all. D David uh, will, will tell you that um, we are very, very strict with our produ production schedule. We sit down um, and we're actually planning a year ahead. So David is now planning the 2023 production schedule because orders were taken and now falling into 23. And he's very specifically allocates numbers to markets. So it's not on a first come, first serve, first come, first serve basis, Richard. It's Japan will be allocated 100 units. Europe will be allocated 200 units. The UK will be however many units that might be. And that's how we build up the total production that we plan. Good. OK. Uh, and the other thing that's been... Uh trending as we've been speaking is i think you said last time you might give us a drum solo this time but um uh, I, I might just if we got time at the end i might insist on you doing that i'm sure your repertoire has grown since we last heard you to say these well but. I, I embarrassingly I, i'd like to say it had but embarrassingly it hasn't i have found since being owned from new owners and since moving house just over a year ago i seem to have been engrossed in um, in other things and I haven't spent a lot of time practicing my drums, so I'm going to decline giving a drum solo. But maybe if we do this again in a year's time, I'll promise I'll practice and do something then. 
Well, that's fantastic. In which case, uh, as I say, I think we're a little ahead of time, but um, I don't know if we're ready to go to the 7-170 seven, seven, walk round. Simon, I don't know if you're ready to jump in at this point. Uh, well, yes, if you can just do some kind of seamless BBC segue for about one minute, I will run downstairs because I'm upstairs in the far corner of Gatwick and I've got a long way to go, OK? So I'll disappear and pop up again in a minute. So, so Graham, let's fill that... Uh, that well, we were going to do a poll, I think, Richard. No, we can do a poll now. When should Caterham make an EV? It'll be very interesting to see the result <laughs> because I think in the 10 months since we did this webinar... I think there's been a fundamental shift in attitudes about EV. So I'll, I'll be really interested to see the results of this. As an EV owner, I will agree with you. Um, <laughs> there you go. As, so 324 people online at the moment. We've got about 280 or so that have answered. Graham, one of the one of the things that has come up when we talk about electric vehicles, I hadn't really thought about it, was I'm thinking of as new vehicles, but a few people have mentioned whether at some point Caterham might be allowing people to retrofit older Caterhams with electric drivetrains. So if you've got a cross flow or you've got an older car that you want to modernise but keep your original one, whether that's something that Caterham would consider at some stage. Um, certainly, I, I think EV will, will, we will talk about later on, I, I think. Um, and uh, our plans are underway for EV. Um, and if I'm honest, the tax and the uh, new board member, he has been tasked with looking at EV strategy for the whole VT group, because VT are a large multinational of uh, predominantly of dealerships around the world. And they're looking at their whole EV strategy for uh, VT. And that includes us. So we uh, have some very detailed um, conversations and some plans and discussions. And, you know, I'd like to think it would be as easy uh, as saying, yeah, we'll sell them for retrofitting. But I think the, the, the sad thing is it will depend upon um, the, the chassis type. Uh, it will depend upon the powertrains and how they, how they bolt in, you know, the, the, the motors, where they bolt in, how they bolt in. You know, we will obviously be designing them if we do a seven, um, we will be designing them to fit a current seven. So if you've got an older cross flow or something, I don't know, uh, because I'm not technically up on it enough, um, where the fitments for engine mounts and battery mounts and motor mounts and all that sort of thing, how they would go. Yeah. But, you know, it's certainly something worth thinking about. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to see there's a small minority of those who say over my dead body. It's always good to know you've got some, you know, sort of uh, diehards out there. So um, on that particular point, Simon, have we waffled on long enough to get you into uh, into position? Yes, if you're ready to go, I am. Over to you, Simon. OK, well, uh, here I am at home in my own personal garage where I've assembled a few of my sevens for you to have a look at. And we're going to start by having a look at the new 170 model, which is over here. So you get to watch me walk uh, in all directions backwards and uh, probably fall over, which Ben will capture for us here. So the 170, as you can see, is completely different from any other seven and doesn't look like any other car you've ever seen before in your life because the wing, rear wings are a little bit narrow. We should talk about why that is, and we have done before, but uh, as a bit of a refresher for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the 170 and its predecessor, the 160, were created for the Japanese market. Now, it's, this is way before VT bought us. It is obviously a very important market, and it's because they have this K-car rule which is cars of a certain size, which have significant tax benefits. And another very big benefit, which is you can park them anywhere rather than proving that you actually have somewhere to park it at home. The K car rules are um, 1.48 meters wide, 3.4 meters long, uh, under 660 cc. Now, Caterham is only 3.1 meters long, it's very, very short, but it is wider than 1.48 meters. So that's why the 170 and the 160 look a little bit different because they have narrow rear arches. And inside those narrow rear arches is the axle from a Suzuki every uh, pickup truck. It's, it's a K-class truck um, and it, it will fit nice and easily. You'll remember that. It's the Bedford Rascal, effectively a later generation of it. Um, so 170 has come along to replace 160. Now 160 was going great guns, but unfortunately the engine that was in it, Suzuki K6A, for anyone that wants that sort of detail, that went out of production. And we had a bit of a hiatus while Suzuki brought the new Jimny in place. Now, uh, in Jimny in Japan, the Jimny is very small. You've all seen it and you're familiar with the shape of it because it is a K car. 
whilst we only get it in one liter and slightly bigger here in the UK and in Europe, in Japan, the JDM model is a 660 cc car with slightly narrower arches. It doesn't have these plastic flares on it. We had to wait for Suzuki to get their act together with that engine. It's inclined in most applications, but in Jimny, it stands upright, which is what we need here in the um, uh, seven. So if we take a look at that engine, I'm sure everyone's very, very excited to see under the bonnet of a 660cc 88 horsepower car. Follow me then, here we have it. Uh, surprisingly different and very, very small. I think the most interesting feature here is the engine cover. We've tried to tidy up the engine bay. Um, I'll take that off. That's mainly because of my OCD and the fact that Suzuki in their wisdom have put these coil covers in opposing directions on three. I don't know why they would do that. It's driven us nuts. So anyway, it's, it's, it's ensured that we've actually put a nice engine cover on it, which I will I'll do that again later because I can't do it. There, there we go. I'll tell you what, Ben, come around here. The other thing we'll talk about while we're under the bonnet and I'm manhandling that cover back on the press cars, which they won't like. Is something we introduced um, cool, probably three years ago now is a build pack. We should have done it ages ago. Uh, when we went back to sell build cars, we wanted to recognize the builder building the car. I'm sure some of you have seen this before, but I imagine it's, it's new to a lot of others. The cars in this case, you, you probably picked up there. This car has been built by one of our guys, Anthony Athwell, very experienced, and he gets to put his name on that car. I have threatened to put their mobile phone numbers on their car as well, so you've got 24-hour warranty service as well. So let's pick up some of the features of the 170 itself. We talked about the narrow rear arches. Uh, but in this case, this one in particular, this is a 170R. Previously, we only offered the 170, or the 160, sorry, in an S model and a base model as well, actually. But now we have both S and R to complete our range properly, any engine in S or R version. Um, that means we've invested a little bit of money to make sure that we can have under there carbon front arches. We've got uh, carbon wing protectors that you can't see from that angle, but it's no matter. Um, the other bits are a straightforward fit from the Series 3.7. But in its most um, base guise with the aero screen and without any paint, you're looking at a 440 kilo car, which is the lightest seven we've ever built. And I'm sure I've said this before. We think it's the lightest production car anywhere in the world. No one's challenged me yet on that. Um, but I think that's a great thing to say about a, a car that's heritage is built on lightweight. The 170 has got a, a few new features on it. So first of all, we've got the alloy wheels at last. Uh, previously, we had a steel wheel. Uh, we can do some nice clean wheel nuts on that one. Um, but we've had to design our own alloy wheel um, to go on there. The, the difficulty with this is we've got a very narrow wheel. It's four and a half inches wide, four and a half J, which is incredibly narrow. Uh, plus, we've got a, an enormous offset. I can't remember what the number is. The seven normally runs a much lesser than that offset, an old school thing like back in the 70s. So you get this nice deep rim, which people like. So it was, a, it was a real challenge to actually create an alloy that allowed us to have a rim, especially in this um, R version where you've got a black center and the um, diamond cut outer. Um, the, the wheel is called a Juno, just keeping with the tradition of naming our wheels after uh, Greek and Roman gods. No one really knows why, but we started, so why not carry on? Um, it's, it's a challenge to try and create a wheel for a seven with that kind of offset that still looks good. Uh, some wheels are uh, a more required taste than others. We'll be honest about that. We remember when we first put the Apollo out that um, quite a lot of people in the factory weren't keen on it. And we've grown to really love that wheel and think it's fantastic. And we hope the same will be um, true of the Juno wheel. It's obviously lighter than the steel wheel as well, which has contributed to the car's lighter weight. The other big change in the car is, and we've seen this before now because we've talked about it a lot. This is the first production car, or production seven, I should say, to have LED rear lights. I perhaps should have had one disassembled so you can see what it looks like underneath. I know people have been wondering where we got them from and what, uh, what car they came off or wherever. It is actually a case from design. And the nice thing about it is a case of uh, form following function. We have a really, really small footprint for that light. You can see it's been the rear light, uh, the rear arch on the uh, car just about takes it. And that's kind of defined where we put everything in that light. We had very little choice as to, as to where it goes. But it means we've got a very small, compact light and very bright rear lights. We're really pleased with that and hope uh, a number of you are taking it up. Of course, what it does is it means it cleans up the back panel and we can use, lose the fog in reverse. The fog lights are incorporated into the cluster. And then a neat little trick, and we can just about get away with it um, on height, is the reverse light is incorporated into the, the rear number light, the rear number plate light. So that's it, back of the, um, uh, the S as well. 
we think it really tidies up the car. This was actually quite an important uh, feature for the Japanese. It was a byproduct. It wasn't um, uh, required by them. But the cleanness of the back panel is all important to them. So they'll actually stand their number plate away from the rear panel. And the only thing they want to see on there is the badge and the rear filler. In terms of performance, obviously, we have um, a newer, far more modern engine. So you've been able to squeeze a few more valuable horsepower out of 660cc. So it's about 87, 88 horsepower. Um, and in terms of emissions, because the car is homologated for Europe, which we need for Japan as well, 109 grams per kilometre. I'm sure most of you don't worry about that, but that's actually really good. And the benchmark I like to use is to say that that's actually less than a Yaris hybrid. So you can look at your neighbour when next time you roll out your 170 and their decadent ways burning oil and how filthy they are, and you can go for a drive in the 7. Driving the 170 is what this car is all about. I can give you all those numbers and the reasons we do it, but there's a reason that uh, there's an awful lot of love for this car in the factory is because it is so much fun. Um, one of the reasons is, is down here. Look. These are 155 tyres, uh, which is not wide in anyone's book. I can't even remember what car they were originally destined for, but it will be a very low power hatch. Um, we wanted to keep it narrow because the car hasn't got an awful lot of power, so we wanted the car to move around on the road. We didn't realise how successful that would be at the time, and I uh, um, spent uh, many a happy day in uh, 160 development at an airfield in Norfolk getting that right, and later on we did a super sprinter at um, another airfield and tuning that as well. But what you'll find is you've got a car that moves around at relatively low speed on the road. Now, I know we are all power freaks. And everyone wants a 620 or something like that. But honestly, this car day to day is actually a lot more fun. And that's what we buy them for. It's enjoyable to move. You, you want to feel like you're driving the car and you're in control of the car. And you, you want it just to, just to slip a little bit on the road, a little bit of a sideways moment. And that's, that's what we get. Uh, a lot of people seem to shy away from that. I, I want big power. But... Phew, for people of a certain age, like me, late 20s, you'll remember that when it snowed, you used to go out in the snow in your Ford Cortina or Capri or Escort or Anglia or what other Ford we all grew up with, because it was brilliant fun. You were sliding around and you were doing it at a slow speed that you couldn't possibly imagine. We built a car that you can do that in now all the time. Track days in them are epic. It's really good. It's like driving from the 1950s, sliding around in big four-wheel drifts, just about catching that BMW M3 that's a little bit further down the road. Because let's not forget, you know, 440 kilos. Okay, by the time it's dressed up, this is, this is probably a, a heavyweight at about 460. It's still an awful lot of power per weight. And I should have done the maths upstairs. Let's call it 180, 190 brake horsepower per ton, which is a, a fair amount of weight, a fair amount of power per weight for sure. So it's still a relatively quick car, 16, just over six seconds. And who cares about the top speed? Because you're not going to get there, frankly, on the roads. While we're down here looking at these two cars, uh, I've still got some time to kill. I know I speak very quickly, so sorry about that. Um, there's a couple of other things we should, we should look at. Um, now, obviously, these are our press cars, and we like to spec up our press cars. But something that we, we are trying to do more and more, and if you talk to the sales guys, you understand, is that the 7 is a very personal car. We all, we all love our cars. I know most of you have kept your cars for a very long time and cherished them. Um, you want it to be yours. And what we want to do, owners to do is to enable them to have their new car as theirs. So rather than just the bland black interior that most of us have lived with for a very long time, we're starting to provide options on different colors of leather and the, the way the trim works. So if you have a look in this car, Ben, we can see we've got the biscuit interior. We even got Alcantara gaiters around the gear lever. We've got a different uh, stitching pattern on the seat and the Caterham 7 logo in Boston to the back seat. In an ideal world, we'd be creating as many combinations as anyone wants, because actually, if you have a play with the configurator, which I encourage everyone to do, you can lose hours to it. You'll create the car that you really, really want beyond just the, the basic black interior. Down the front end, we've painted the headlight bulbs. You know, these are the sorts of things that owners tend to do for themselves later on down the line. I think that car's got the LED headlights as well, hasn't it? And lastly, on the, on the car, we also have a new stripe. I mean, that's the most important thing ever. It's an incredible amount of development work goes into a vinyl stripe. But we do have a nice, neat new stripe as well, which has been created just for the 170. It's actually slightly thinner to match the rest of the car. 
So hopefully in about five minutes, it feels like I've been talking. It may have been a little bit longer than that. This is a very potted uh, insight into what the 170 is. It's an important car for us. It's an important car for Japan. But I encourage all of you, if you get the opportunity, drive one. You sort of re-engage with what driving is really like with, with 170s. I know we don't have one on a higher fleet, but um, I can tell you in, in the past, I've been given the option to drive a 620 or a 170 for an entire track evening. I've had a quick go in a 620 and I've spent the rest of the time in a 170 because actually, don't tell anyone, it is more fun. It's just a fantastic car. Back to the studio. <laughs> well, Simon, thank you for that. And also for Ben. Um, ben, if it was left up to me, I think your job's safe. Um, but um, sadly, I, I'm not the one who'll make the decision. But um, for something that we thought would try as an experiment, I think that worked very well. Um, and before we move into questions and answers, and we've had quite a few scrolling up uh, on the open Q&A uh, chat, Thank you very much to Graham and some of the others for answering some already while we've been with Simon. But before we go to Q&A, uh, it's time for another one of uh, John Martin's interesting polls. So hopefully John's uh, back on, on track and we can pass over and have poll number three, I think it is, John. Over to you. Yeah, hi, Richard. This is, uh, this is John again. Um, right, we're ready for our third poll. This is a two-parter, this one. So there's two questions here. How would you describe your primary reason for owning a seven today? And the second question is, what defines the seven most to you? Right, we're at about uh, nearly 300 out of 324, and we'll share the results. And back over to you, Richard. OK, thank you very much. Um, and I think as uh, what clearly comes out in that is probably maybe a surprise to some that, that touring is such a, a, a strong reason, um, not surprised by uh, track days. And um, I suppose, obviously, performance and handling come out so well, um, although Britishness maybe is less of a worry for us, bearing in mind we're a largely uh, British audience. But again, it all helps, I think, Caterham as well as ourselves understand what the market wants from the club as well as obviously from the manufacturer. So thank you for that. So that now leads us on to uh, question and answers, particularly the question and answers that uh, came in um, before tonight. Um, and in particular, I've grouped them. There were so many. Um, if I said hundreds, I'm not exaggerating. So what I've done is group um, them into uh, general areas because we had quite a lot of um, duplicate or very similar questions. Um, and um, certainly I'd like to thank everybody for taking that. If, as they say on the radio, if I don't read your question out or your name, it doesn't mean we didn't consider it or indeed that we can't look at it offline or later on. But uh, Graham, you gave us a really uh, good insight into VT. So let, let's start with a few strategy questions that came in. And um, I'll lump these two together. Dave Gemzo was asking, where do you see Caterham in, in 10 years time? Um, uh, and in also, what, what are the strategic objectives of those new owners? How far ahead are they looking and what sort of things are they hoping to achieve? I know we touched on it a little, but it may give you a chance to flesh those out now. Yeah, um, indeed, Richard. Um, uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, one of the things that, uh, as I touched on before, that uh, Takahashi-san was keen to elaborate or, or keen to insist upon is that he wants to ensure the longevity of the brand. So in answer to the question straight away, where are we going to be in 10 years time? Um, my, my view, uh, I think, and, and that of my, my colleagues is that, you know, we would love to see this brand continuing to go from strength to strength in whatever guise that may be. Now, I would love, and, and reading through some of the questions, you know, there was a number of points about EV and um, hydrogen, and then on that, uh, on the poll, you know, not over my dead body for EV and that sort of thing. You know, I, I would love to think that we could continue to manufacture in some way or another um, some internal combustion engine catering, okay? Uh, purely because I think the world is changing very quickly. 
everyone will be driving electric cars. Um, there's no doubt that the torque in electric car is phenomenal, even on your, your basic electric cars or your basic EVs. Um, but I think there's still something about the oral pleasure of driving, particularly a Caterham or a, you know, any niche vehicle. And I shouldn't say that, but let, any niche vehicle that has a roaring exhaust and a, an internal combustion engine at, at the front of it, you know. Um, sadly, I think politics and also um, socio, social, uh, if that's the right word, social politics uh, will play against us. I think as time goes on, more and more of the younger generation will see us or see an, uh, an internal combustion engine as a dirty, smelly, noisy product. And we will be forced to go down some form of alternative path. Um, so the good news is we have um, two new board or three new board members, two of which have come from large, large organizations, one of which was particularly involved in the strategy uh, of Toyota. Um, and, you know, he is doing a lot of work with us now, TAC, on what is our future and how we move forward. Um, there's been a number of questions about hydrogen. Uh, I've noticed coming up on the on the spot questions, um, and, and I'll be honest, we we are in the very early stages of looking at alternatives out there. Um, one thing I have always said to the press when they've asked me before, um, Richard, is you know we we make no bones about the fact that we piggyback and we utilise OEM powertrains. Um, you know, we all saw what happened to TVR when they decided to bin off the, their powertrain and build their own engines. It sent them down a slippy road to oblivion. And, and we, I think that's one of our strengths and how we've managed to stay strong through all sorts of um, um, financial crisis and, and what have you, because we can order as and when we need them. So if the orders diminish, then we can order appropriately. We don't have to build so many cars to stay profitable. We can manage the business that way. We have the flexibility. And it'll be no different when we come to alternative power source. We will look to do some sort of deal or agreement with a major OEM and utilize either their battery or some form of battery and their um, powertrain as well. Um, now, we, we, we have a strategy that we will continue into the 21st century and beyond 2030 or whenever Boris or whoever's going to be prime minister determines uh, IC engines will disappear. Um, and we are working on it just now with our, our, new, our new board members to help us get to that point. So, there's, so the strategy for us is to ensure the longevity of the brand. What guys that will take, I don't know. But at the same time, you know, we want to embrace new technology. I think there will be demand there. Um, I, I would love, I would love to think, as I say, we could build internal combustion cars, but I think various factors will prevent us from doing that, whether it be socioeconomic, economic, political, or even uh, supply, you know, because we're finding it harder and harder now just to um, source internal combustion engines. So we will be pushed down some alternative fuel um, fuel avenue, I would imagine. I don't know, David and Sai, whether you'd like to chip in on this, but I'm conscious it's me done all the talking so far. Uh, I think for me, Graham, it's just keep doing what we're doing for as long as we can, but just try and do it a little bit better. Uh, I think we can all acknowledge that we, we don't make a perfect car today. Yeah. Um, there are things that we are frustrated about ourselves, um, you know, and there are constantly a long list of improvements we like to make. Um, so uh, I can see us continuing to, to fight that battle, make those improvements, drive the quality up. Um, but for me, where I'd like to be in 10 years is, is the business looking largely similar to what it is, um, hopefully still fairly robust, but still making sports cars. I think we've got the opportunity to still stockpile a lot of ICE engines with the, the uh, shareholders that we've got. So that could extend our period of selling ICE cars. 
Um, I think you've touched on all the different um, uh, opportunities that are around EV and, and hydrogen and so on. We know that's going to be challenging. We know we're, we're starting to consider where we go with it. And I think we will see those powertrains come into caterings. Um, I think motorsport will become increasingly uh, important for catering. Uh, I, I hope so too, uh, because I think, you know, cars will become harder and harder to enjoy on the road, which will drive us off the road to tracks to enjoy. So as long as those tracks can remain open and they're not closed down for noise reasons or, or anything else, I think we need to be considerate of, of growing on our motorsport um, options. So um, uh, I think the other element for me is, and we've, we've never been able to answer this question, but there, there has to be another product. There has to be another product to live alongside, to supplement and support the seven. Um, I think we know that there are some signs from our board that they would support that, that they actually want to consider that. Um, and I think we'd be foolish not to. It's something that certainly in the 20 years that I've been here, we've, we've not been able to answer what is the, uh, the correct route to go. Uh, and uh, we've had a stab at various different products through the course of time, none matching the success of the seven, um, because it, it's a legend as we know. Um, but yeah, 10 years down the road, I hope we're still here, still making cars, still putting a smile on people's faces. So if I can just latch on to your last uh, little uh, interesting tip bit there, Dave, about, you know, alternative product. You know, a lot of people, when they talk to me, mention that that little car that Lotus have decided not to build any longer, the Elise. And of course, you know, in, in the pubs where we get very drunk and can imagine the world as we'd like them to be, uh, you know, would Caterham take on the Elise? Is there a chance of that? Or is that the type of thing? Is there even a remote chance that's the sort of thing that will likely happen? Well, wouldn't that be a lovely idea? <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't it? Wouldn't be a lovely idea? It's, it's not a groundbreaking idea, is it? It's just following suit of what this business is built on, which is taking a great product from Lotus. They've decided that it's run its course within their business um, and then go, well, hang on, guys. If you're asking me, I still think there is a market for that product. I've owned various Elise's, Exige products. I think they're absolutely fabulous. Um, do I think that it would suit the Caterham brand? Do I think that we could distribute that product successfully? Yes, I do. Um, do I know the cost of, of doing that? And do I know if, if Lotus are, are prepared? Uh, well, that's perhaps not something that we're able to share. Sure. Um, but as an idea, I think it would make absolute sense, in my humble opinion. But that is my personal opinion. Good. No, thank you for that. And, and also, just uh, picking up on, we've, we've got a lot of questions from people, obviously, intrigued about the fact that the Sigma is no longer available and, and perceive it, perceiving, I think, in reality, thinking of a, a gap in the range uh, particularly a, a gap that most people were attracted to. What, what's the short or even mid-term uh, plans to try and close that gap, if indeed there are any? Yeah, there are no, no plans immediately to close the gap. You know, um, we have now the Suzuki that Simon has obviously walked us around. Um, Sigma is a loss. You know, let, let's be honest. If, if uh, you ask me today, would I rather still have it as a product available, I would say 100%. Um, it's a cracking engine uh, used in all of our, our race series in the UK, as, as we all know, um, and, and virtually indestructible in that set, in that motorsport um, environment. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic engine that works well in our car and importantly is the right price to buy. Um, but as Graham's alluded to, you know, it's, um, it's not for us to, to go out and start making engines of our, of our own volition. Uh, that's not something we're ever going to support. Uh, so when Ford decide to stop selling it, um, it's a real loss. Now, I mean, so I'll speak for Simon and he may want to jump in, but Simon has been in, engaged with looking for a replacement engine for that long before we lost it because we, we had you know, visibility of when it would go out of production. And... Finding a replacement engine is such a challenge. Um, not least, does it fit? Um, is the company who makes that engine prepared to sell it to us? 
do they even have a system to sell it to us? You know, it, you can't just assume that just because Toyota make a nice 1.6 engine that they can actually invoice 250 engines out to you. It's such a small run of engines that, you know, you have to understand, can their supply chain even support that? Um, and then, of course, you, you get into, is it the right price? So commercially, does it make sense? Um, and we have spent months, engaged many consultants, toured the globe, you know, speak, spoken to pretty much every manufacturer people um, could name to try and find appropriate engines. And uh, for whatever reason, it could be any one of those number of reasons, we, we haven't been able to find a like-for-like -like replacement for Sigma. So uh, we will continue with Suzuki and Duratec for the short to medium term. Um, we haven't closed our minds to, to finding another engine uh, that, that could go in between that. Um, but at the moment, uh, I think it's safe to say that we haven't found anything appropriate. Good. Well, thanks for that. Um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be proper if I didn't get uh, the chance to jump on my own personal professional hobby horse. As, as, as you know, I'm, I, I love talking about supply chains, procurement and, and spare parts. The, the whole world is fascinated in that. Um, you will not be surprised to hear we've had a number of uh, people, I, I won't say them by name because they might be on your blacklist, but you know, people have had difficulty getting parts or the parts are not available or they've had their kits and the kits have turned up. Someone rang me today saying, you know, they, they, they didn't have a hose when they asked for the hose to be delivered. It came as two separate parts they then had to put together. So I can understand, you know, the problems, be it Brexit or chips, as you said, Graham, it's a real problem. But uh, what's it like from your side? How difficult is it? And, and is it going to become worse or is it hopefully going to become better? Yeah, um, Richard, you know, <clears throat> I can only apologise to any of your club members and anyone who's on the call here who have suffered problems. Um, the one and only reason we were 80 cars short of where we should have been, uh, sorry, 50 cars short of where we should have been, um, was supply chain. Uh, and it's an area that we've always struggled with pretty much by the nature of some of the suppliers that we deal with. Um, there's an awful lot of small mama and papa suppliers that struggle with capacity. But of course, that has only been compounded through COVID and through the pandemic and, and um, post-pandemic. We're still seeing it. However, um, one of the good things, we've known that, um, we've never really had the resource or the finances to um, try and tackle it head on under the previous ownership. Under the new ownership, um, Bob Lacely, who's come from Nissan, part of his, in his prior life, uh, he was heavily engaged with supply chain. And Bob comes with an awful lot of contacts within the supply industry. Um, and half of the, the suppliers we deal with, he knows someone in the businesses. Um, so we have uh, um, tasked Bob, and, and, and Bob has gladly taken on the role of trying to help improve our supply chain. And one of the things we did, uh, which again, we could never have done under Tony because we didn't have the funds, um, we employed some uh, specialist consultants to come in to look at the issues that we have on a number of our key suppliers. And they have found out, probably if I'm honest, some fairly basic things, um, and I hate to say it, and, and Richard, I really hope you don't say things like this, but they found some low hanging fruit. Um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but to be honest, it is items that we should have seen ourselves, but I think we've all been so busy that we've just carried on the best way we can. So with a mixture of Bob helping us, um, asking these consultants to come in and they've, they've reviewed the business and they've also done some workshops with some of our suppliers, we now have a better picture of simple things like how we should be ordering, more long-term orders, um, the sort of volumes we should be ordering in, what we should be doing with our systems to ensure we get the best information out of those. And we are hoping that 
all of this will lead to um, better supply chain. And at the end, ultimately, what that will lead to is uh, more product through our factory. And, you know, I have put my neck on the line and assured my new owners that we will increase production in order to reduce the lead time for cars into Japan was the first thing. But we actually need to do it just to increase the lead time for all of our customers because we now have a 12-month forward owner book. And, and that's not acceptable. I, I realise that. So we are now firstly working with our suppliers and Bob is working closely with my existing staff in the supply chain to remedy that. Um, we are also looking to increase production within the business and we're actually going to start building some cars down at Gatwick. Uh, and we have, had, uh, we have had capital expenditure sign off for a new paint shop to go down at Gatwick because one of the bottlenecks we've had is our paint shop it's not big enough to cope with the volumes we have already, let alone any more volumes. And we've had to use third party suppliers, but what we found through coming out of the pandemic, they were all way too busy um, repairing damaged cars as everyone got back on the road, that they couldn't fit in paint in our cars. So we had this absurd situation where we had cars awaiting paint for four or six weeks before we could even start to build them. Um, so we've now on top of that, We've ordered a new paint shop that's been signed off by the board. Um, and we are now looking to recruit staff and put equipment in at Gatwick in order to build more cars so that we can eat into, um, into the forward order book. And that will only work if we sort out a supply chain. And we're working on that in the background as well. Oddly enough, I don't know if you've noticed, Graham, a couple of people <laughs> coming out of left field on the question and answer talk about is there any logical thought to building the 170 in Japan rather than in the UK sending sending bits I suppose it's sending bits one way rather than the other but you know straight off the top of my head it's you know it didn't sound like such a foolish idea but you know um, the biggest issue with that and believe you me we actually talked about this at the time okay and the main fundamental issue with that is we have to build all our cars in order to get them registered as road cars. They all have to be built the same way and we have to conform to conformity of production. And if we send a box of bits to Japan and then they buy the engines from and the, and the um, drivetrain from Suzuki, we're failing ourselves and we're failing on the requirements of conformity of production. So it, we have this perverse situation where we have to ship engines and powertrain from Japan on the water for three weeks. We build the cars and then ship them back to Japan for a further, sorry, for three months, and then ship them back to Japan for a further three months. So, but there was no way we could get around that um, because we have to build them under a certain standard at our factory. And I think the other thing, quite a number of our overseas members have, have kept um observing is we've had some struggles with brexit and different legislation as a result of simply just getting low flying into other countries has been more difficult is that is that something that is has been a problem for you is a problem or as an international manufacturer you've been dealing with customs and various other paperwork it hasn't really made any difference as what's the situation yeah. for you now um, so, so now, as we sit, uh, we're kind of operating okay. Um, we didn't suffer an awful lot on parts for production supply chain because 90, over 90% 90 of our parts are, are sourced in the UK. Um, and we, we didn't so much have problems with customs. We've had problems with um, suppliers not ramping up quickly enough for de demand therefore not supplying us on time. However, where we have seen a problem and where some of our customers who are abroad will see a problem is us sending parts out. That has been an absolute nightmare for us. We had a partner in DPD that pre-Brexit, you know, we would ship at a reasonable cost and it would be in France or Spain or in somewhere in Europe um, within two days. When Brexit came along, the cost went through the roof. Uh, we had consignments shipped back to us because they failed customs allegedly and they were going backwards and forwards two or three times they were taking sometimes months to get to the destination the cost was through the roof it's settled down a bit now 
But the result of that is there's an awful lot more administration um, that we have to go through. It takes longer to get to the destination because it has to clear customs and we have a huge amount of administration to deal with. So that's more on the parts we send out to, to our, our overseas customers. Thankfully, touch wood, we, we haven't seen much issue with Brexit for parts coming in. It's been more about suppliers not ramping up quickly enough after perhaps factory shutdowns and things like that. So I think moving back uh, maybe to, to um, one of your areas, I think, Dave, is that last time we were talking about um, potential overseas markets and where where you see yourself going. So, I mean, Graham, do you... Do you uh, where, where do you see the growth areas in the next few years in terms of uh, where you can sell more cars and maybe I can get more members? Yeah, well, I think I'll go with this one, shall I, Graham? I mean, the, the, the challenge at the moment, Richard, is um, not trying to grow markets. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my, uh, you know, my, my sales team uh, here... Um, who look after the export markets and work territory to territory, they will tell you that we've had the most successful year for 20 years and they've not sold a single car. You know, we are order takers at best this year and it would have been possible to have taken way in excess of the 650 odd orders we took. We could have taken 700 plus if we had started to actually sell some cars, actually, you know, try and uh, incentivize some dealers to take a few more cars. But we just can't um, allocate the right number of cars to the right dealers right now. Um, the existing network would happily take 10, 20% more volume than we can currently produce. So therefore, I'm actively turning away dealers. Um, I, all I would do now is if I have a, a new dealer inquiry from a new territory, I would just dilute what limited numbers of cars we can produce even further and have an even more um, frustrated dealer network. So uh, right now, we're really not looking to grow until we can sort the supply chain issues and build the right number of cars. Okay. No, thanks for that. Um, Graham, now turn into probably the, the the area I'm most most interested in. So diplomatically, I've I've, I've left it till towards the end. Um, last time you threw a hand grenade in with the whole idea of the the name of the club, uh, and uh, that created quite a significant amount of work for me and my my new staff, for which I will be eternally grateful. Um, but um, we're over that now. I think we've made up and we're now friends again. Um, but uh, suffice to say, obviously, it is now the, the Caterham and Lotus 7 Club. Caterham is um, very much part of not just the ethos of the club, the name of the club, and in fact, the majority of the owners. Uh, and I think you saw, uh, as a member yourself, uh, the, you know, the overwhelming uh, support and positive vote for a name change so it wasn't a near run thing it's what most of the members wanted and it's now what most of the web members have got so clearly what that's put pressure on me and i know we've spoken about it in terms of what will that mean for the relationship between caterham cars and the club how, how do you see that developing what what will it mean for you and what will it mean for our members could i just ask you to flesh that out for me and the members on the line yeah well First of all, Richard, and, and for everyone that's listening, you know, thank you. You know, it, it's something that's been a bone of contention for many, many years. As I say, I've been with Caterham for 15 years that we felt the by far the largest part of your um, customers were or, or owners were, were Caterham owners. And we felt it was only right it should be reflected. Um, you listened to us at the last webinar and you've taken action and changed it. And for that, I, I can thank you. Um, Richard, you're correct. We have actually already spoken. And I think for the first time in many, many years, we now have a, a dialogue going backwards and forwards between us. Um, and, you know, I, I am certainly not going to go back on my word, which I think I said last March, is if you change your name, we will start to work more closely together. And, um, you know, I think we're in the early stages of it. Um, I think 
coming out of the pandemic hasn't, or going through the pandemic hasn't helped. It's kind of delayed a few things, but we already have a, a number of things that we're talking to you about. Um, you know, we talked about factory visits. We talked about um, um, uh, previews to new products, that sort of thing. Um, and all of these we, we are talking to you about. And it goes much further than that. It goes support at events, whether it be at your track days, whether your open days. Um, and, you know, I would love to help. I really would. I think myself and David and Simon um, and my marketing team are keen to get on board to help where we can and actually for us all to benefit. You know, I'd like to see a better relationship between the two of us. Um I was reluctant to do anything under the Lotus Seven name because I I felt you were um, you know, promoting one of my uh, key um, competitors in the market. Yeah. That's now changed, um, and now that the, the door is open for us to communicate. So you know it, we are already talking about various I think events, factory tours, track days, that sort of thing. Um, and I think you know if your members have any other ideas. These are the sort of things we should be talking about. Um, I will just caveat it with, of course, whatever we do comes at a cost. <laughs> um, as you well know, it nothing is ever free. Even to turn up at a show usually comes at a tremendous amount of cost of organisation, pitch fees, all of those sort of things. Um, but within um, within um, a sort of sensible amount, we're willing to support the club in various events and do various things with them to, to bring the club and us as a manufacturer together. Cause I would love to see a better relationship between the two of us. Good. Yeah. And I think certainly you touched on one thing there that we've had quite a few questions about, which was, as we discussed, Graham, using that knowledge in the club to help when it comes to product development or technical forums. And I know, again, as we've spoken, there are difficulties of how to introduce that in a safe way for both our members and the factory. Um, you know, we, we live in a real world where people have confidentiality and there are certain restrictions. But you know, I think it was, was it Simon said uh, earlier on, you know, the, there's a vast amount of knowledge out there, which which goes back far longer than we give it credit for. And uh, there's probably the right person in the club who's got the right answer to the problem that has suddenly arisen. Uh, so anything we can do, as we say, you know, it's in our interest, the manufacturer continues, it's in our interest that caterums continue to be built and they continue to be serviced and supported. So I'm very pleased to hear that, certainly. Um, so I think on that score, the other thing that uh, a slightly left field, but I think we had it last time as well, was on that score. Is there any chance that uh, Caterham will ever have a presence back in Caterham, do you think? Is there a hankering for a showroom or a back to, or is that, or is that now a, well, I say dead duck now, if it ever was the case, but it's surprising the number of people who've said it. Yeah, um, I, um, someone commented because I, whilst Simon was doing his tour, uh, I apologize, Simon, I wasn't watching you. I, I know about the 170, sorry for that. But I was trying to answer some of the questions on the um, that, that have been yeah. posted. And when I was dealing with it, you know, there was there was 12 or 15 questions, and now notice it's up to 63, and I haven't had a chance to, to look at any of them since. But um, I noticed a couple of those questions come in about uh, the showroom. And there was one question which I noticed, um, and I'm sure Dave and Si have spotted as well, and that is around the um, how to build program. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, whilst I felt um, that was beneficial for us, for the Joe, Joe public who, who maybe doesn't understand what the, the seven is, to see how it's built and what goes into it, I think was great. However, I will be honest and say, you know, I was slightly embarrassed by how the factory looked, how the fact they panned around the outside and there's weeds sticking up and a bit of rubbish and some traffic cones outside the door. And I sat there watching it and I put my head in my hands and thought, oh, my God, could we not have just got the gardener in to clear it up or something first? You know, but they really did give us a day, rock up and had freedom. You know, I said, yeah, you got freedom. And I didn't even know they were filming outside, you know. So, uh, so yes, that was rather embarrassing. Um, one of the things that we have to tackle as a business is that of our um, property. 
And that's one of the things we've flagged up to the board of VT. Um, we have a lease on Dartford that is due to expire over the next two to three years. Um, we have a lease at Gatwick, which has a break clause within the next two, the next two to three years. Um, and one of the things we have to do is decide what we want to do as a business. We took on the Gatwick showroom under, under Tony Fernandez. At the time, we were meant to be producing the Caterham Stroke Alpine. Um, and that was the only reason we took on that glass, I'd like to say glass showroom. It's not even a glass showroom. It's still a warehouse. But it was a very expensive showroom for us at the time. Um, so we have spent already a number of hours discussing with our colleagues around what is the strategy for the business. Do I think we will end up with a showroom in Caterham? I, I will be honest now and say I really don't think so. Um, I, I, you know, we did look when the Nairns um, gave us notice on the old showroom. We looked all around that area because we were determined at the time to try and stay there. And there was just nothing suitable in, in that area. Um, so whilst it may sound lovely and idyllic to be on Kate, um, Caterham High Street, first of all, I don't think there's anything there that we could go and use. I think there's an old garage up the hill. But even that, I don't think, was big enough for us now of what we need. And it was very dilapidated. Um, so we have to look at what we do with our factory and a showroom and whether moving forward we combine the two again, um, whether we retain the showroom for a, uh, because we have an option to extend the lease uh, and look for a new factory premises. But what is key is us increasing our volumes. And we have, a, we have an absolute limit at Dartford of about 550 cars. We literally can't squeeze any more cars in or any more builders. Um, so if, if my, my owners in Japan want more volume, and I've told them this, we will need bigger premises. So that is something that actually is on the board agenda now every month. And we are looking at it with a view over the next six months to try and make a decision. But I, I, unless David wants to chip in and tell me I'm completely wrong, I really don't think we will end up on Caterham High Street. I'm sorry. David, did you want to add anything? No, I mean, I, I can't uh, disagree with Graham. Uh, I, I have to be honest, and, and this is coming from someone who used to live in Caterham for uh, a number of years, that I would see very little value in, in us returning there. I'd, I'd like to think the brand itself is, has outgrown the, the, the town. And if we are to relocate uh, the factory, the showroom, um, any of our sites, there are far more appropriate locations. And I would suggest somewhere in the Midlands, in the automotive heartland, is a better place uh, for recruitment, for suppliers. Um, you know, I, I just think that uh, there would be very little benefit from a, a manufacturing uh, perspective to be within the M25. But one of the things, Richard, sorry, just to finish off, you know, one of the things we find just now is a problem is, is recruiting staff in an operational role. And I think if we went somewhere like Caterham, you would struggle even more, um, you know, because the demographic of the population there is, is not um, your, your kind of factory worker or factory technician or whatever we want to call them. Um, so, so those are the things that we have to take into account as well. And in the 21st century, there are all sorts of issues that we face um, around um, staffing as well as location and everything. And, and those are all the things we have to consider. Great. Um, Graham, I've just had the prompt that I should have gone to poll five at this stage. I was just uh, far too interested in listening to, to, to you talk about Caterham. So... Uh, I think we'll give everybody, a, 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 including myself, a quick rest of the uh, of the larynx, and uh, I'll ask John if he can pop up again, and we'll we'll have the. I think it's the final poll of the evening. Is that correct? John? Um, it's not actually. We've got one one further one after this, yeah, Richard. Okay. Um, so this is poll four. Which of the following models comes closest to your idea of the perfect seven? We have still got a, over three hundred people on the webinar at the moment. That's encouraging, John. Then haven't, we haven't bored them senseless yet, and, and everyone's decided to leave. Uh, far from it, I think. <laughs> Good. And I'm just going to share the results and hand back over to you, Richard. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
probably uh, just sort of the most interesting is maybe uh, ask you guys, Graham, David, or or maybe Simon, what what do you take from those? I, I've heard a lot of them say, I've read, what is it, the seven, the 310 is supposed to be the the, the optimum seven, or, or if you listen to auto car, but I don't know. Does that does that surprise you guys? Um, no, I, I think it's a, it's a pleasant surprise to see that the owners have been listening and got it absolutely right. The 7310R is, uh, we would say, was the best car we made. Obviously, now the super engine gone, that's, that's quite a blow. It is, it is a perfect balance, so it will suit an awful lot of people. The um, 7420R would have been... <laughs> It's my choice. It's what I personally own. Um, is that right for everyone? It's not really, actually. You know, um, it's a car that you have to start to react to an awful lot more than others. Obviously, I'm hugely disappointed to see that the, the 170 is down there at a, a tiny 4%. I think we could we could shift that opinion if a few more people had um, a go of them. And likewise, it's interesting that the 620 um, isn't that high up on on the uh, radar there either. And I think uh, actually, you know, as owners, it, people are wise to the drive experience. Uh, that's probably what's different. If we did this on piston heads, uh, the, the answer would be 99% 620s. But we still see, you know, the K series super light, which we all love. It was a great car. Um, and I think I, we ought to have a sub poll of who voted for that owns a K series car and hasn't actually driven a Sigma um, because the 310 is, is very, very K series like except it'll last about a hundred times longer and you don't have to worry about the engine quite so much, you know? Um, so it's very interesting. And a, a little handful of um, a real heritage hardcore there with Lotus 7 Series 2. Very interesting. Good. I, I think it's quite, I, I thought it was quite interesting, the spread as well. You know, it was an even spread between the Duratec, the Sigma and the, um, and the K-Series, which I, I found quite surprising. But yeah, great to see. Good. It's, it's indicative, Graham, isn't it? that uh, we can't just build one car as much as we would have loved to. This business would be so much better if we built one car, one specification, that uh, uh, people want different things from the seven. We saw that earlier on, that some people want to go touring in it, other people want, want track days. So we have to try and accommodate that, and that's why we have a range of cars. Yep. So just oddly enough, the, the, the point there about the, the K-series reminded me of a, a question that uh, I could have covered earlier, but gives me a chance now to do it. Uh, obviously, I'm a K-Series owner myself, so I, I recognise this. And that is how concerned we should be running K-Series with the advent uh, of E10 petrol. We, we run a, a, an article in Low Flying about, you know, the E5, E10 debate. But um, have you managed to do any more work at Caterham about, you know, the validity of um, uh, whether we can run older Caterhams on E10? Yeah, it's terrible news, unfortunately, Richard. You need to sell your car as quickly as possible and buy a brand new one and, you know, <laughs> problem solved. Um, in all honesty... My wife to ring you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in all honesty, we haven't been able to do very much more and most of what we're getting is anecdotal. Uh, and it, it feels a little bit like the um, Y2K bug in, in many ways is that people felt that there's, there's going to be this switch over and it's going to be a disaster. There are so many variables... Um, what we take a lot of comfort from is that we quite late to the party in E10 fuel, but Japan's been running it for a very long time. Uh, and they haven't had anything different in their cars to what we have here. Um, the States have had it for a long time and some of the other European countries. So it has been around, it has been out there, and it hasn't been causing any problems. With the, um, the K-Series itself, we don't know. And unfortunately, Rover isn't there anymore to go and ask. So it's going to be one of these cases where experience tells us, and not just experience from seven owners, but we'll, we'll get it from the MG owners and freelanders and places like that over time. Um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be more of an issue if the fuel uh, just sits for a long time. I know that that's been one of the concerns. It separates a little bit. Um, but most of us are using our cars and uh, you know for a while. And there is always the, the super unleaded option. And a lot of people fill their cars with super. They just feel it's better. I've been hearing um, anecdotally that mileage is going down on E10. There's been bits and pieces of that bouncing around various forums, you know. So it's one of those, one of those areas that we're going to have to build up knowledge over a period of time uh, and then try and understand. Uh, and yes, at some point we might find that there is something that's a weak point on the K-Series, but likewise, I think there'll be someone that comes along and offers a fix for it as well 
very quickly alongside that. So I'd love to be able to give you a, um, a fantastic answer and say, we've taken some cars and we've put them through lab tests and we've done all that, but we have to remember you know, what resources are available to us and it's just not possible, unfortunately. Um, we're, we're starting to run very close to, to the buffers in terms of what we said we'd do running time. I've had a prompt that we've got one more poll to finish, which um, I think we'll move to now. And then that means we freed up on the agenda and then Graham and the team, you know, we, you know, we'll, we'll throw questions at you then until you say stop. So, John, uh, if you just want to go to the next poll. Yeah, here we go. Um, so uh, another two part of this one. So we've got a, a, a part one and a part two. First question is, where did you buy your seven? And second question is, who does the routine servicing? for you. We've also had a couple of questions about the last poll and why we didn't put things like CSR and 360s in. We, we, we discussed long and hard about the list and it, it got too long in the end. So we had to cut some out, I'm afraid. So uh, maybe next time we could do a longer poll on that question. So I think we're done and I'll share the results. And back to you, Richard. So again, um, actually quite positive news on the servicing side, which means that um, if most people are actually buying their cars from Caterham, then they must be, you must be doing something right, guys. Although if you've been tracking the question and answers, there's a couple of people commenting about their sales uh, experience with Caterham. But are you going to be doing anything or is there any plans to um, improve or develop the sort of secondhand side of the business at all? We now have, Richard, a, you know, a, a fairly widespread dealer network uh, in the UK, which I think we're, we're really happy with. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to sit here and say that uh, all our sales experiences are perfect. We have to acknowledge where we can improve and where we've made mistakes. But I can only refer to our, um, you know, our dealer network here in the UK and, and say that uh, I think they are a bunch of very enthusiastic professional people. Um, and I think geographically, we've got a good spread and all of those dealers, you know, that they offer um, used cars, new cars, parts, motorsport support, servicing, repairs, upgrades. So I think we've got a really good network in place in the UK. Um, likewise, you know, across Europe, I think we've got a good network. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, we can't rest on our laurels for sure. I think customer expectations around um, the, the, the sales process uh, are only increasing um, and we have to keep pace with that. And what are, we, we get to, our, our Scottish clan keep clamouring for me to ask you, are we ever going to get a, a Scottish dealer or, a, or an authorised agent? Is, is there a possibility of somebody north of the border? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say if there's one open area in which we would consider it Scotland. I think it is a loss that we haven't got somebody up there. Um, I know I sound like a, a bit of a broken record here, but if I appoint a dealer in Scotland today, they won't be seeing their demonstrators until 2023 at the earliest. Um, well, that's not much of a dealership. So uh, everything does circle back round to resolving the issues with supply chain and production. Um, so that we can uh, look to, to grow the business again, but at the right time. Um, and the right time for Scotland, unfortunately, isn't now. Um, perhaps we could consider a, a service agent. That is something to look after existing customers. Um, but for a, a, a full dealer, I would say, unfortunately, not, not in the next 12 months. And in terms of um, where you were talking about um, dealers, how do you – can you give us some insight? What sort of de – what makes the ideal Caterham dealer for you when you're looking to put the cars with dealers? Is there any insight into how you go about selecting them? Yes, typically we visit the Lotus and Morgan websites. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I jest, but um, I think we're natural bedfellows. And we have been for um, probably the last decade or so since we've really... Uh, turned our, our heads into developing and growing our networks across Europe and, and the UK. But um, I, I'm not scared of being in a showroom with a, a Morgan or a Lotus part next to us. I think it's a benefit. I think a British sports car centre works. Um, for every customer that we will lose to, a, to Lotus, we'll gain one from Morgan. 
Um, so I think it's a fairly circular sales um, experience in, in that sense. But we're looking for enthusiasts. You know, we're not looking for large PLCs who can just fill the showroom with, with stock on the floor that gathers dust, because then that encourages them to start discounting the cars, and that only drives the residual values down. So, you know, we want committed, enthusiastic dealers, and we've got that now. You know, if I, I look at our dealer network up in Cheshire, we've, we've got Oakmere run by um, Johnny Jarrett. He races with us. You know, he's raced through the Academy Series. We've got Henry Williams down near Bristol. Henry races with us. You know, we've got the, these guys who are committing their spare time to, to uh, continue to, to race our products uh, as well as try and grow the business. So, yeah, th those are the people that we need. So I'm very conscious, guys, because I know you've got quite uh, a commute and you're still at work. So we, we've started to run over now. Um, uh, just one sort of final question again, um, Graham, in terms of uh, if you've been following the track on the Q&As, uh, quite a few people, we've talked about volume, we've talked about inflation, we've talked about, do you see the, the cars increasing in, in price? Are people like me with a second-hand car going to find it's going to be worth more money in the next six months? <laughs> um, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball uh, Richard, uh, I think Caterham's have always been fabulous at retaining the value, as I'm sure everyone on this uh, webinar is, knows that. Um, and, of course, now things are fantastic, but that's a, also an indicative, I think, of post-pandemic and what's going on in the outside world, because you, you want to buy any car now, the prices seem to be holding or increasing yeah. you know it's it's a it's a it's a silly strange market i would imagine over time if we ever get finally clear of this pandemic and touch wood i hope we do and i hope it becomes just like the flu as they as they're intimating it may be uh, and we get back to a normal life i would imagine as oems start to manufacture and catch up on the new car orders the used car market will get back to normal and prices will stabilize at a reasonable amount I still think um, Caterhams are will hold the value really well. You know, I, I think we are niche enough to be able to do that. I think the market is the right size to be able to do that. Um, I think if you want to sell it, probably now's the time to do it. But if, but if you want to replace it with something else, it's only going to cost more because um, everything's gone upwards, hasn't it? Nothing. Uh, you know, I'm looking to sell my daily runaround. And uh, it's gone up in price over the last couple of years. Wow, it's fantastic. But when I look at actually what I want to buy, so have they gone up more so, you know. So uh, I think that's just the way of the world just now. And I'm, I'm sure when it, even when it levels out, Caterham's will still be a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic, uh, sensible purchase for a, um, a petrol head car lover. So... Thank you, Graham. Um, just one final, final opportunity for um, Dave or Simon or yourself. If there's anything you want to take this now, an opportunity to address anything which you thought I was going to ask and I didn't, then please, you know, now's the time. Um, otherwise, I'm going to say my thank yous and let everybody uh, go off to enjoy the rest of the evening. So is there anything from you guys on your side before I close? Um, firstly, I, I'll let Dave and Sai finish off, but I, I would just like to thank everyone for their comments um, and, and questions. I have been trying to answer some, uh, as, as you will see, um, but I just haven't had time in amongst the, the conversation. Uh, I'm, I will, I think, Richard and John, you will be able to supply us with the questions because there are a number there that I would really like to take away and, and study a bit longer. Um, you know, I, I noticed there's one or two disappointed owners there um, with either the experience of the, the sales process or um, the kit process or something like that. Uh, you know, and, and I'd like to answer those more latterly, if at all possible. But uh, I'd certainly like to take away, I'd like to thank everyone for their honest comments. And, and hopefully um, you think I've been honest back because uh, I've tried to be and so has David and Simon as well. And I think just to reiterate something I maybe should have mentioned, and it clearly won't, um, 
we we do get a session after these meetings and we do talk about specific questions that weren't able on the night and i have passed back that information to our members where it's something that needed a little bit more detail uh, we did that with the titan diffs last last time that we had it for example so uh, yeah our, 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 we we will provide that and as i say if there are particular ones that we need a more detailed uh, answer on then we've done that previously and we'll do that this time as well so yeah that's a that's a that's a fair reminder thank you graham yeah dave Hi. yeah i mean i i know it's been touched on richard but i'd like to acknowledge the uh the, the name change uh i think uh that's fantastic you know from uh where we were doing this webinar a year ago um to actually getting it done you know fantastic to, to you guys and the team for, for getting it done because i know it was a hard slog to get it done and i thought it was done in a, a very good way but it's really appreciated because that that conversation has been going on for a lot longer than the last 12 months, I can assure you. Um, so to actually see that and to be able to build bridges with the club, I think um, will only benefit both of us. Uh, we need to rely on you guys for, for feedback. Um, we need to uh, you know improve that relationship so we can get better ideas about where you want us to develop the product and understand that a bit better. Um, and that will all come from a, a closer relationship. You know, you guys should be the best brand advocates that we have. Um, but I appreciate you'll only be that if you've got uh, a supportive relationship from the manufacturer. So, yeah, that's, that's my thoughts. Uh, I really think it's uh, good to keep doing this. Um, and maybe we get one in the diary for the latter half of the year. Great. No, looking forward to it already, Dave. Uh, Simon, anything from you? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, to echo what the, um, the other guys have said, in congratulating the club on doing this. I think putting it together very well. We've had over 300 participants. I know one or two are uh, dropping off, probably like flies when I start talking. Um, but what's been interesting, picking through the questions at the same time, doing the same as Graham, if I can pick off one, just type a very quick answer, I will do, it is that the interest the owners are expressing about the future of Caterham and where we're going, which is really positive to hear. It's not talk about the past and where we've been and what their car is. It's, it's about what success means or how success um, can come to the company in the future, which means it's great. You know, it, we're in this together. Um, uh, and as Dave said, I think it, it is it's a valuable forum now for us to understand our owners that much more than we already do. Obviously, we engage with a fair number, but um, I'm not necessarily as, as committed and passionate as the owners group do. Uh, I can't believe how quickly this evening's gone. You know, it's, it's really flown by. It does feel like a always leave them wanting more is probably a good tactic with the web, webinar, but it feels we could have gone on for a very long time covering so many more topics. Uh, you touched on EV earlier on. I thought we may talk about that a lot more this evening. Not that there's a huge amount to, to say right now, unfortunately. It's coming. We know it's coming. Um, I saw the comments about engines and them running out and, you know, what can we do about that? I think we, we just have to embrace the future. Um, it, it, one stat we've been talking about recently is uh, the new car sales in last year and the fact that the Tesla Model 3 was the second best-selling car in the UK, which is a staggering number. You know, after the Corsa, Tesla, then you're into Fiesta and Astra and, and so on. Electric cars that are, are coming, they, they are very good, actually, you know, um, and I think the general acceptance and understanding of those is improving. So we we'll probably could, it'd be good to keep asking uh, that question and the feel as, as these webinars go on. Um, and hopefully it won't be too long before people can get the experience of, of, of driving electric seven, because I say, you, you know, we, we know we have to do it. Um, 2030 will come around very quickly. I mean, at that point, it is just pure ice. You know, there is, there is the hybrid option, but who knows what's around the corner. When Dave talked about, uh, and he did not exaggerate about the lengths we've gone to to find another engine, uh, the, the, the challenge is, is that manufacturers are no longer investing in um, internal combustion technology. Why, why would they? That is not the future. So we all have to accept that uh, uh, cars as we know it are changing and rather be afraid of that. Look at what the new ones um, benefit us. And I, I think for us as uh, seven enthusiasts, our car is going to have more relevance going forward, um, particularly as, as new cars are being sanitized, this whole new raft of safety improvements which means that the car is going to do a lot of braking for you it's going to dictate when you can steer it's it's going to do it's just, it's trying to take the human element out of driving and i won't say we're trying to put that back it's all about the human element in our driving so um, a long may it continue and uh thanks for your support 
Good. No, and I'm glad you touched back on the electric vehicle side there because we do, as you say, we get quite a few questions. You know, what year can we expect to be able to buy an electric uh, Caterham? Well, presumably as 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 quickly as you can possibly produce one you're happy with. But uh, no, so. As I say, I mean, it'd be nice in the next uh, next year with COVID, I'm not going to say behind us, that's a dangerous thing to say, but we said at the last one, I think, uh, Graham, we're looking forward to meeting the team in at some events, getting some face-to-face time yourselves with the members and us with you, because uh, it has been more of Zoom than shaking hands. So uh, I'm going to hope, as I say, the, the invite's out there for you to come to every one of our events, and I'm sure you'll take as many opportunities as possible. But uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, tonight uh, for your, um, your attendance, and I'd specifically like to finish with special mention for yourselves, Simon. I know Ben, I don't know if he's still around, but Ben... Uh, Dave, Graham, thanks for taking up uh, what is an evening and giving us your insights. On my side, I'd like to thank Michael Calvert, uh, John Martin and Stephen Hubbard, who've been keeping the the hamster wheels going in the background. They put a lot of effort into this. um, And uh, I I think hopefully that's come across and shown in the webinar. So I'm going to close the webinar now. I'm going to say thank you to everybody for attending. Uh, Good night. Have a safe journey home. And as I say, we'll be in touch. So good night to everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.